Well, good evening and welcome to our evening service for, of worship here at Norton Lane Evangelical Presbyterian Church. If you're watching on Zoom, a very warm welcome. Apologies if you're watching this recording that the live stream uh, wasn't working. Is that a little a technical uh, difficulty there? Let's uh, hit the notices for this evening. Is that very similar, in fact, exactly the same as this morning. Everything you need for the service will appear on the screen. Um, next Sunday, uh, Lord willing, on the 14th, I'll be preaching in the morning and the evening, which will be on Zoom and live stream on YouTube. And I'll send uh, links out with those uh, details as normal uh, during the week. Wednesday the 10th, we have our mum's Bible study at half past one on Zoom. And also midweek prayer meeting, 7.45 on Zoom, which will be our, our last instalment. Of, uh, of the letter to the Hebrews, which will be led by Chris. So that's Wednesday at 7.45 on Zoom, a midweek prayer meeting. Friday the 12th, we have our jam club at four o'clock on Zoom and also youth group for 11 to 18 years old-ish is also on Friday night at seven o'clock on Zoom. Those links will be sent out for the uh, during the week for those events. And this Friday as well, on the 12th, is our church quiz, which I'll send you more details out uh, later on in the week, but also the first picture round, so you can have that to look forward to uh, nearer the time. So that's Friday, 7.45, our church quiz. All are welcome to join us. As we gather to worship, let's have a moment to quiet our hearts before we come to uh, worship our God together this evening. Our call to worship this evening comes from Psalm 107. It reads, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Well, as those who have been gathered by our gracious Lord and God, the accomplished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit in applying that to our hearts and our lives, let us sing our first hymn of praise together this evening. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring.
Let us pray together. Our great and glorious Lord, our King of glory and of grace, the one who is high and lifted up, the one who is exalted above all, the one who is the King of kings, not the king among kings, Lord of lords, not Lord among lords in equality, but the highest, the greatest, the most high, who's given a name above all names, a name of which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, we don't see that yet in our day. We see those who live in, in abstract a rebellion against God. But one day when he comes again, every knee shall bow, whether in fear or in absolute devotion and love. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and will worship. And we long for that day when we can gather with the redeemed in the new heavens and the new earth to be with our Lord, to see him face to face. That we see him now by faith as we read your word, as we come to gather together at church Sunday by Sunday. So we pray that soon we will see him by sight. Help us to desire and to, and to delight in the Lord Jesus Christ, to long for more of him, more of his grace and mercy and fellowship. More of his companionship but being more dependent on him. Oh, great God, help us to come in humble submission, to bow, to bow the knee and to confess, not just with our tongues, but with our lips, our, our mouth, with our hands, our feet, every part of our body, that Jesus Christ is Lord and all to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come to our Bible reading now this evening as we uh, continue in uh, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Paul is writing from prison, uh, having had a report from Epaphro Epaphroditus um, with a, a financial gift from the Philippians to Paul. He's heard a report that there's disunity and there's persecution uh, in the church and in the area around the church and so he's writing not just to encourage them to thank them but to help them and to guide them as well so let us uh, read the word of god from philippians 2 verses 12 to 18 let us hear the word of god therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should all, all you should also should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. Let us uh, come to our God in, in prayer together as we pray for our, ourselves and for others. Our Heavenly Father. We thank you that Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, of the whole cosmos. For you have given him, given him all authority in heaven and earth. There is not one square inch of this planet, of this universe, which he cannot point to and say, mine. And so, Father, we pray 
that those who belong to him, those who he has made, those who he upholds and gives breath to and life to, that they will be brought be brought into union, will be brought into subjection, will bow the knee and confess and accept Jesus as their king and honour him and love him and serve him and worship him. And so we pray for the work of missions. We pray for the work of church planting around the world. We think especially in our own denomination of the church plants in Zurich, which I think this today has its first service. We thank you for Florian. We thank you for sending him back home to Switzerland. We pray, we thank you for the building you provided for them. We pray as well that you will bless them, that you will protect them. You know, Zurich is a very expensive place. We pray that you will provide all their needs financially, just to be able to rent the building and pay the bills just week by week. We pray for their core group, you will have mercy on them. We know that new churches are under a special attack and attention from the evil one. That you will protect them and bless them. We pray that you will give Florian and the church good relationships with other gospel preaching, Bible being faithful churches in Switzerland. You know, historically it was such a, a place of activity and of reformation, but not lo no longer. We pray you'll be at work. Bless Florian. Do a mighty work in Switzerland that Zurich will just be the first among many, many gospel churches preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ in that land and across many of our countries in Europe, which are in darkness, in secularism, in, in outright denial of anything to do with religion. I pray that you'll be at work in France in Germany, in Italy, and many other countries that we could think of. Father, do a great work there. As once in history, Europe was the centre, and missionaries were sent out from Europe. And how we see that, that many missionaries from other parts of the world are coming to Europe, because they are in great and desperate need. So we pray that you will be at work there. We thank you that the gospel is thriving in countries in Africa, in South America, that the church is being built among hostility and persecution in the Middle East and in China, in, in Korea. We thank you and praise you. We hear only so much of the numbers of and churches that are growing and numbers of Christians, and yet we have no idea how many and who they are, but you know every single one. All of their hairs on their heads are counted. They are precious to you. You know all who are yours and they will be saved. And so I pray, we pray, Father, that you will send out more, more the workers because the harvest is ready. The work is plenty. You will raise up more workers to go out, more than to go and preach the gospel, to plant churches, more families committed to moving to areas to join new church plants. Please, Father, be at work in this country, in this continent for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to come to you God's word now. I'm going to come back to the letter of uh, the Ph Philippians, to the Philippians. And uh, there's an interesting question which always, um, well, in our house and in places I've been to, always creates dispute, always creates argument and people choosing sides. It's which comes first, jam or cream? When you're having a scone, which comes first? Is it jam or is it cream? Now, the, how you answer that question will depend on whether you follow the Cornish way or the Devonshire way. Apparently, there's a Somerset way, which is a, a third way, which I haven't worked out what that quite is yet. Maybe one with jam and one with cream. But which comes first is really important, isn't it? You might as well have an order in your mind of that you've been... Uh, that I've, 
of what you do first when you make a cup of tea? Do you put the milk in the cup first and then pour in the tea? Or do you pour in the tea and then add the milk? See, what comes first is important, isn't it? Getting the order of things right matters. You know, those are trivial examples where getting those orders right doesn't really matter. You still get the same end result. But getting the order right with the gospel in the Christian life is really important. It's very important. You know, Paul has been laying out from chapter 1, verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. He wants, he knows there's disunity in the church. We see that beginning of chapter four. And he wants them to live their lives together corporately in a manner that is worthy and fitting of the good news of Jesus Christ, of what he's done. He wants them to be who they are. And they can do that, as he goes on to explain, through humble unity. And then when we get to chapter 2, from 5 to 11, he lifts up, he holds up Christ's person, his work, his achievement, as in, and, and his example as a one, a means by which they have unity, as we saw last week, that his exhortation, his, his death and resurrection was a means by which their unity was achieved, that Christ's humiliation is a, a motivation for their unity. And then he goes on in our passage today from 12 to 18, and it starts with a therefore. And therefore, because of who Christ is, because of what Christ's done and what he's achieved and who you are, because of God's grace in Jesus Christ, you should therefore, in response, work out your own salvation. We're going to think in a minute just about what that means. We need to notice the order. It's not work out your own salvation so that you then earn Christ. It's because of what Christ has done. It's because of what God has done through Jesus that therefore means you should then respond by doing this. See, it's gospel, it's gospel logic. It's gospel indicatives, what God has done, followed by gospel imperatives. Therefore, you now go and do. And we see this in Exodus, don't we? Just before God gives the Ten Commandments. Isn't the first commandment is not the first thing he says. First thing he says is, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt. I saved you. I rescued you. You are my people. Therefore, follow these rules. Therefore, you can now live this way because of what I've done. Gospel indicatives, what God has done, followed by gospel imperatives. And that's why the order is so important. Because it's not you do this so that God then will do that. Oh, that's merit. That's not the gospel. That is trying to do it yourself. No, it's what God has done, as we've seen from 5 to 11, what God has done in Jesus Christ in sending him, one who came, who, who humbled himself, taking on a form of a servant, who died on a cross as a sacrifice for sin, who then was highly exalted, gathering people to himself, creating and purifying a people for himself. Because of what God has done and achieved in Jesus Christ, because of who you now are, from chapter 1, as the saints in Jesus Christ, because of that possession, that gift that you have, that Christ has bought for you and freely given, therefore, you now live like this, in response to what God has done. And so that's what we're going to see this evening we're going to see what it means to work out your own salvation. What it means to live in response 
to the salvation we've been given together through the finished and accomplished work of Jesus Christ. We're going to see just what that means for our day-to-day lives, what that means for our lives together. Because who we are as belonging to Christ, bought at a price, affects the whole of our lives. So we're going to see uh, six things just briefly this evening. We're going to see the meaning of what it means to work out your salvation, the meaning, the method, the manner, the motivations, the means, and the ministry. We might get through them all this evening, but I am keeping track of time, so we'll, hopefully we will. So firstly, the meaning. What does it mean to work out your own salvation? Well, sometimes the best way to work out what something does mean is to start with a negative. What doesn't it mean? What doesn't it mean when Paul says in verse 12, work out your own salvation? What it doesn't mean, work for your salvation. It doesn't mean if you live like this, then you'll get right with God. It doesn't mean um, you contribute to your salvation. God has done 50%, now you do the rest. No, it doesn't mean that. John 3.16 is clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's all what God has done. It's all a gift from God, you read in Ephesians 2. A gift that he's lavished on you. You who were dead in your trespasses and sins, God has made alive in Christ. And it's not work out how to be saved. No. So that's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you contribute to your salvation in any way. It is all from God. And so what does it mean to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? What does it mean? Remember, salvation is a gift. It's a possession from a gracious God that's been given to us as a gift. And what it means to work out your own salvation is it means to bring about the influence and the effects of that salvation to every part of your life. It's that salvation that you have received by faith in Jesus Christ. That salvation has implications and should then influence and permeate the whole of your life. It's a possession to be explored and enjoyed. Like if you get given an island, you don't just sit on a boat by the side and just look at it. You want to go in and explore every cave, every rock, every tree, every animal. You want to go and explore and enjoy it. Well, this is a continual process. It's continually continue to work out your own salvation because it's to work out your own salvation to work out how coming into Christ under his lordship to work out what implications that have for every aspect of life that takes energy and effort it's not a sit back and a passive thing it's work it out Work it out with energy and effort. Work it out together. This is a plural command. This is Paul talking to not an individual. This is Paul talking to the whole church. You together, as you live together, as brothers and sisters, children of God, work out how this salvation, this wonderful gift that you have from Christ, how that impacts every aspect of your life. It's like if you do baking and you don't use a bread machine, but you make bread and you try and um, you and you have your dough and you put your yeast in. But you have to work the bread. You have to knead it to get that to the yeast into every nook and cranny of the bread. And it takes time to knead it and pump it and and to spread it out so that it gets into every every part of that dough into the whole lump. When you get married, 
Yes, you get married on a certain date and a certain time, but then the whole of your life is marriage. You then have to work out together the implications of that marriage, of that covenant, of that union you've entered together for every aspect of your life, for how you spend your money and time, for where you live, for what you say, for what you do. Your marriage, which started at that date, has to be worked out together. What does it mean to be married? How can we keep bringing about this marriage and this union together through every aspect of our life? <clears throat> Your salvation was purchased by Christ and was given to you. But what Paul means when he says, work out your own salvation, you need to work out the implications for the gospel. That's why he says in 127, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's, he doesn't say, let your manner of speaking or let your manner of Bible reading or let your manner of coming to church on a Sunday be worthy of the gospel. No, he says, let your manner of life, every part of your life from Sunday to Saturday, morning and evening, when you're asleep, when you're awake, when you're at church, when you're at work, when you're by yourself, when you're with other people, family, friends. Because letting your manner of life be worthy of the gospel, together working out our own salvation, bringing it about, spreading it and seeing its implications for every aspect of life includes our transformation of every aspect of our life transforming how we think and how we use our money transforming how we use our time what we use our time for transforming our marriage our relationships our jobs how we work our speech our leisure time at church what we do what we give every aspect of life as jesus said remember in the great commission in matthew 28 all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me not just authority over you when you're at church but authority over you in every part of your life i mentioned it in a prayer is that from a speech from abraham kuyper who's the president prime minister was one of the leaders of the netherlands he said there is not one square inch in the whole cosmos that Christ cannot point at and say, mine, mine. And so there is not one square inch, not one second of your life that Christ cannot point to and say, mine. And so we have to work together to work out our this wonderful salvation and what it means and how it transforms every aspect of life it means we need to ask a question as well do you just live as a christian on a sunday does it affect every day of the week or is it just going to a club you just do one day a week or oh, i'll do that god thing that's for this day but the other days or oh, those are my days are there areas of your life which you put a big keep out sign to the Lord saying off limits? This is how I do it. This is my career. This is my work. This is my leisure time. I do that Bible stuff and God stuff on a Sunday and maybe at other little points of the day. But this is my time now. You know, we need to bring every aspect of our lives together under the gospel bringing every aspect of our life in tune with the gospel with the lord jesus christ because he has a lordship over every aspect of our life so that's what it means to work out continually work out your own salvation that's what paul means but secondly What's the method? Well, what, what does it look like? How do we go about doing that? Well, he says uh, three things. Well, two things. He says, first, comes with obedience. You see that in verse 12. 
Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. It starts with obedience. As we saw in the, in the verses before, in verse 8, obedience was a characteristic of Christ's life. You can read the Gospels and you see Christ's obedience, obedience to his father, to the law, perfectly willing submission. And therefore, it's following Christ's example of humble obedience. And obedience should be a mark of the Christian's life. Someone who is not doing it forcefully, not under, not reluctantly, like telling a child to go and clean their room or to help tidy the table, but, but cheerful obedience. Because we've been brought under a new master. When you confess Jesus as your Lord, it's not just confessing him as your saviour, and accepting that wonderful positive side of the gospel and that wonderful gift and receiving that and saying thank you. No, it doesn't stop there. It's receiving Jesus as your Lord, which means he is your master. He has bought you. You belong to Jesus. You are not in the dominion of darkness anymore, the Satan anymore. You are now in the kingdom of light. You have a new master, the Lord Jesus Christ. One, yes, who is gentle and lowly, who is welcoming, whose burdens are light. But he is your Lord. And therefore, we should obey and not just confess him as Lord in our prayers or when we sing, but actually confess him as Lord with our whole life with everything we do. It means obedience. But how do you know? How do we know how to obey the Lord? How do we know well, what he wants? Where well, he lays it out for us in the Bible, in his word. Go and read the Ten Commandments. Go and read the Paul's letters. Go and read the Gospels. Read any part of the Bible. And see the standard of what God expects. Knowing that we are not obeying in order to earn our salvation. Remember the gospel logic. It starts off with what God has done. Like when God gave the Ten Commandments. It's, I have saved you. You are mine. Therefore obey and live like this. So we can work out our salvation by obeying, by obeying what God says, by obeying our Lord and Master in every aspect of our lives. It's not just obedience, it's cheerfulness, cheerful obedience. You see what Paul says in verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do all things, not some things, not only a couple of things, but do all things without grumbling or disputing. You might think, well, Paul, this sounds so unreasonable. How can we possibly do that? Remember as well what he says in the beginning of chapter four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Remember, Paul is in prison at this time. Paul knows he's not in, on some deck chair, relaxing with someone giving him drinks. No, Paul is in prison. He's in a Roman prison, which is not like a prison today with a, a nice floor or bed or a television, nice meals provided. It was a horrible place to be. Paul is in prison, yet he still says, do all things without grumbling. Remember in Acts chapter 16, we read about Paul and Silas in prison, singing, praying, singing out loud, cheerful songs, doing all things without grumbling or disputing. Because when you grumble, when you dispute, you are actively rebelling against the Lord who's put you in that situation. 
or has asked you to do that thing or to not do that thing. Remember in Numbers chapter 11, remember the grumbling. Remember with Moses, uh, grumbling against God's leadership. You brought us out here into the wilderness. In Egypt, we had loads of things to eat. We had melons and cucumbers and all sorts of delicious food. And what do we have here? We just have here manna bread, just bread. They are grumbling against and rebelling against God's leadership thinking they knew better. So I, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 uses that as an example, Numbers 11, says that was written for our example, for us to learn so that we might not grumble. He says, do not grumble because that is active rebellion. And that grumbling could be not just outright rioting, but mumbling under your breath as well obeying but doing it in a reluctant grumbly kind of way so there's no do all things without grumbling do all things cheerfully why can we do this because of the one that we serve we do not serve an unfair and a harsh taskmaster we do not serve someone who is cruel, someone who is unkind, someone who doesn't care, someone who wants nothing to do with you. You serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Go and read 5 to 11 again. You see who it is you serve. That's why Paul can say rejoice in the Lord always. Not just rejoice always for no reason, but rejoice in the Lord always because in the Lord you always have a reason to rejoice because of who you are, because of what Jesus has done, because of who you belong to, because of his love for you, his daily fellowship and walk with you. The fact that one day you will be with him forever. His giving of his Holy Spirit to sanctify you, to beautify you for the method of our our working at our salvation should be with should be cheerful obedience and it is hard it is really hard that's why paul at the end in chapter four talks about bringing everything to god in prayer because we need to pray that's why paul here is talking to the whole church because we need to encourage each other because it is hard, we need to sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron. We need to speak the truth in love to one another. We need to be honest with one another and say, can I talk to you privately with this aspect of your life isn't in line with what it says in the Bible. We need to help each other and to do that, not to put each other down, not to laugh when someone else falls or fails, but to lovingly be kind to one another, caring for one another. As Paul says at the beginning of chapter two, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others and their spiritual health <clears throat> more significant than yourselves with cheerful obedience. And Christ is the perfect example, isn't he? Cheerful obedience through mockery, through homelessness, through weariness, through isolation and rejection. And yet he cheerfully obeyed his loving heavenly father. And so as we have been brought into union with Christ by the Holy Spirit working in us, that master copy is being, being put onto our lives as we work together, as we work out our own salvation, as we bring every aspect in line and in tune with Christ, we should start to see in each other and be encouraged lives of more cheerful obedience, even in times of suffering. We're going to do one more. I said six. We're going to do three tonight. So we've had the, the meaning of what it means to work out your own salvation. 
We've seen the method, cheerful obedience, and we're going to end with the manner. What is the manner in which we should work out our own salvation? Well, Paul says it there, doesn't he? At the end of verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. With fear and trembling. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that Jesus is a, is a terror, is a horrifying master, and therefore we do it in a, in a cowardly way that we hide under the table, petrified of, of doing anything wrong, that he might crush you. No, it's not like that at all. The complete opposite. It means it's doing it with a constant awareness that the whole of our lives are before the face of God. We live, breathe, think, speak and act. It's all before the face of God. That's why working out our, our, our own salvation should cover every aspect of our life. Because God sees every, every aspect of our life and he wants to see it brought in line and under the lordship of Christ. So it's living before the face of God. Remember Psalm 139. Where can I go from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I go to the furthest ends of the sea, you are there. If I go down to Sheol, you are there. You are there everywhere. And it's to do so with awe and reverence and love to honour God, who is good, who is gracious, who holds you in his hands, who loves you more than you could ever know, who delights over you with singing. It's to honour God with our hands, our lips, our feet. Remember in Proverbs, the, the repeated refrain, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, that awe and reverent love and delight in God, is the beginning of of how to live in the way God wants. It's having God as your top priority, having God as number one, your reference point, your Polaris, your North Star. You now there's a, a quote from uh, Sinclair Ferguson where he explains what, fear, what the fear of the Lord means. And he says this, it's a reverence and pleasure and awe and joy which fills our hearts when we realize who God is and what he has done for us. It is a love for God that is so great that we would be ashamed to do anything which would displease or grieve him. And what makes us the happiest is when we are doing what pleases him. So that reverence and pleasure awe and joy so it's the complete opposite of a of a of a fear and a, and a terror and being petrified like the relationship that child should have with a loving father reverence and pleasure awe and joy which fills our hearts when we realize who god is and what he's done and that should be the manner in which we work out our salvation the manner in which we have cheerful obedience, doing everything before the face of God, which all of our lives are, and with reverence and pleasure, with, with a delight and a joy in serving and obeying our God, who made us and redeemed us through his Son. Do you know this kind of fear? Do you know this kind of love? Is this the manner in which we as a church here are working out our salvation through to create more humble unity, through cheerful obedience, with fear and trembling, living before the face of a wonderful and a glorious and a gracious God? Psalm 2, it says that we might serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. This is how we can shine more brightly, which Paul will go on to later, that you might shine as, as lights or stars. This is how our lights will shine more brightly. We bring everything in tune with Christ, living under his lordship, 
working out our own salvation together as brothers and sisters through cheerful obedience and with fear and trembling because of who God is and what he's done. We live our lives of reverence and pleasure and awe and joy. This is the beginning. Next week, Lord willing, will be the second part of what it means to work out our own salvation, that wonderful salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, what it means that is worked out into every aspect of our lives. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn now this evening, which is uh, take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take our moments and our days, let them flow in endless praise. Let us sing together for God's glory. Let us pray together as we close our worship this day. Our great and wonderful Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, who bought our lives at the price of your own, of your blood shed for us. Oh, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful and glorious and such great salvation. Please help us in response to delight in encouraging each other and working out our own salvation together in every aspect of our life. Please help us with this. Please guide us, convict us, encourage us and be with us, Father, that we may shine more brightly for your glory and for the good and the growth of the gospel and the church of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. In his name we pray. Amen.